Andy Allen. On the telephone lines at the moment we have Carl McKellen, Mark Durkin, Fra McCann, Sinead Innes and Jonathan Buckley. All very welcome to the meeting today. Um, can I just remind members, as usual, about their telephones? Um, when, we're, when you're not speaking or when we haven't called you, can you make sure, please, 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 that you put your phones on to mute? Thank you very much. And then we'll just move on then to agen agenda item number one. So our first item is apologies. At present, we have no apologies. Um, so I'll now move on then to item number two which is chairperson's business. I have nothing uh, further to report this week and I'll move straight on then to item number three, which is the draft minutes. The draft minutes of the 20th of May can be found at page six of your meeting pack. Um, I'll go to the members in the room first of all. Are members in the room content with the draft minutes? Yes. Yes. Okay, members on the telephone lines, are you content with the draft minutes? Content. Yes, content. Thank you very much. I'll move on then to agenda item number four, which is matters arising. We have a few here. The first one is um, you've been provided at page 11 with a response from the Golfing Union of Ireland um, to committee queries on the reopening of golf courses. Um, so can I just ask, first of all, members on the phones, are you content to note that? No. no. Thank you. Members in the room, content to note? Yes. Okay, thank you. Move on then. Then you've also been provided at page 12 with a response um, from the Committee for Finance on the raised paper mm. on coordinated budget scrutiny. Uh, members on the phone, first of all, are you content to note that response? Content to note. Content to note. Grant, Sorry, you, sir. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I got uh, thrown out of the conversation. Okay. Uh, just, where, where are we again? We're on Matters Arising, and it's number two on Matters Arising, which is page 12 of your meeting pack and it's a response um, from the Committee for Finance on the raised paper. And just asking, are you content to note? Okay, members in the room content to note? Yep. Okay, the next one then is at page 13, uh, which is a response from the Minister of Justice in relation to financial impact of COVID-19 on councils. Members on the phone content to note? Content to note. Content to note. Thank you, members in the room content? Yes, content okay. Yep. Move on then, page 14 is a uh, departmental reply to the committee queries on preschool admissions process. Um, again, members on the phone, um, content to note or any comments? Content yeah. to note. Uh, sorry. Mark, go ahead. Note. Yeah, Chair, this was an issue I had raised. First, yeah. I have to, I suppose, with flag concern that it has taken over three months uh, to get this back. Uh, you know, fair enough, I know it's, it's primarily a, de a, a Department for Education uh, issue, but there is clearly cross over here. Uh, you know, the Department, just the final paragraph, they said that they plan to bring forward amendments to the current legislation in advance of the next preschool admissions process. This uh, subject, or, or this issue has been subject of judicial review, actually, already, so... I mean, uh, it is one for education, but maybe one that we should be <laughs> reliant on to flag with them. That actually, in the knowledge that something <laughs> is wrong and legally flawed, they've continued with it for this year. Uh, the, the reason I raised it is, and, and they do clarify in the letter, the tax credit is not a qualifying uh, yeah. criteria or benefit. However, the issue is that there are people you have on tax credits who are much more socially disadvantaged than other people on universal credit. So, so, so there are anomalies there, and I look forward to seeing what the Department for Education is going to address it. No, I, thank you, Mark. I, I agree with you, and I'm glad you brought it up at the time, because I'm sure, like other members, we're starting to receive emails from um, parents whose children have been una unable to get into um, their, their local schools. Um, and there have been parents on tax credits, so um, I think it's vitally important um, that, that those, those, those people that are on low incomes, many of them, um, that, are, that have, you know, have that, the ability to avail of those services as well. Um, is there anything further that members, Mark in particular, that you think that we should do, whether it's, it's contacting the Department of Education or um, any further on that you want us to do? Chair, but if, if you want to, then I, I suggest that, that we do, and maybe write to the department and ask them to outline their plans uh, to change this. They say they're changing it for next year. Yeah. Uh, we, like I raised this on the 6th of February. We're now 
now at the end of May, and I know we've lost time due to the the COVID crisis. However, I'd hate to get the next Christmas, and and, and them not have done this yet. And, and because they're leaving themselves wide open to more challenges as well, and the more people that become aware of the successful challenges, uh, the, the less tenable the department's position becomes. I mean, I suppose from a, a committee perspective, I mean, this is affecting some of the you know those disadvantaged people within our community and people who are are on low incomes. Um, so I, I I have no difficulty um, as a committee mm -hmm. in in sending something through the Department of Education for those reasons alone. If that's okay. Yeah, okay. Members agreed on that. Is that okay, members, on that issue? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I've now forgotten where I am. Remind me. You are on page, page 5. Page 24 is the next one. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Members, um, if you then turn to page 24, um, there's a departmental reply to the committee um, on queries about the breakdown of Sport NI funding um, per council area. Um, uh, first of all, members of the phones, any comments or, or, or are you uh, happy to note? I'm content sure. to note, Chair. Okay. Members in the room? Oh, oh, sorry, was there somebody on the phones that wanted to say something? Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, I think it's helpful for the briefing that will help with Sport and I. And I'm happy to note until then. Okay, thanks, Carol. Uh, members in the room, anything that you want to bring up on that? Are you content to note? Content to note. I think um, just to follow up on what Carol has said, um, while we've been given the council's allocations, it's what they're actually being used for and who's receiving it um, as an outcome. Because how do we know that this budget is actually going to the wealth of sporting bodies or if it's concentrated on one or two different types of sports who happen to be clever enough to apply you know, all over to this? Um, so. When we have Sport NI, I suppose, coming up on the, on the 3rd of June, maybe we can go back to that then. Okay, and just members, just for, um, there's something that I, I, I kind of spoken to Kevin that I wanted a wee bit more information on. Um, some of the breakdowns, some of the tables are great and give you actually yearly figures. Others, the figure is from 17 to 20, and it was around this, the issue of even to do with community planning and things like that. I'd like to know from them um, on a, what they pay, what it is yearly rather than grouped as one um, one amount in total. And I, I mean, kind of noticed Stephen for community planning for uh, for Mana and Oma District Council was one thousand, and then you jump to ABC Council who received seven thousand eight hundred and forty seven. So it's just as no, you know, is that because that was what they put in for and what they applied for is what they got, or it, what's the criteria around that? So just before their briefing next week, um, I would be minded to ask them if they could just break down some of those figures a little bit more um, on uh, on what they paid per year rather than a, in a block. If members are in agreement, um, I'm going to ask um, that we, we ask for that information before the meeting next week. Okay. Is that OK? Uh, yes, go ahead. John, uh, no, I would concur with your comments and I suppose probably to further emphasise what Kelly has said. I suppose that was one of the purpose for asking for more information is to see a further breakdown of the the particular sports or wealth of sports that were included in the funding program. I think that would be important to help facilitate the conversation whenever Sport and I come before the committee, if it's possible to get it. Okay. I think it's better that we, we write to them and, and you know tell them that these are the issues that are going to come up next week um, so they're not blindsided either by some of the questions and it would give us the information next week. So if there's anything else that members feel that we should be asking of them, um, can they just feed that through then to the committee clerk um, before the meeting next week? Is that okay, members? we move on? Yeah. yeah, agreed. Okay, then we're moving on then. Um, right. I've lost my page. Are we going on to item number five? We are. There we are. Um, item number five then is our briefing today by the Arts Council on the impact of COVID-19. Members, you've been provided with a briefing paper at page 32 to your pack. And can I then welcome um, Sport NI and... Arts Council. Oh, sorry, sorry, Arts Council. Apologies, apologies, the Arts Council. Um, and I think, Roisin, you're going to um, give us our briefing. Is that correct? That is correct, Chair. Thank you very much. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you to the committee uh, for inviting us to address you today, along with three of my colleagues. Lauren, Director of Arts Development, Damien, Head of Drama and Literature, 
and Julie, Head of Community and Participatory Arts. Uh, both Damien and Julie are also going to contribute to this opening statement. Uh, and first, I'd like to apologize to the Deputy Chair for saying that Don Alu is an arts organization in her area when it's not. That was a mistake on our part. Okay. Uh, so in my written submission, I asked the question, what did the arts sector that we fund look like pre-COVID in order to give you some context? And I've drawn out some key figures for you, namely almost 7,500 individuals working in our annually funded clients, though only just over 1,000 in a permanent capacity, the rest on a contractual basis, supported significantly by over 4,000 volunteers. It generated 53 million in income in 1819, of which one was 25 million came from ticket sales and other commercial activity. And that's an important figure because that's the income that has vanished overnight, leaving large and small organizations, be they venues or local festivals, those which deliver classes in their local community, scrambling for their very survival. However, the, se the sector entered into the pandemic already in a precarious and fragile state due to successive reductions in our ability to fund it over many years, uh, with a loss of one with 40% of our income in real terms between 2011 and 2018, resulting in resources being paired to the bone and higher than average rates of chronic mental health and well-being issues in our sector. By way of illustration, I've given the committee figures on our revenue grant in aid in comparison to Wales, uh, which receives almost three times the amount for a population of 3.1 million in comparison to ours of about 1.9 million. And this is not, this is not a one-off, uh, rather it's a sustained picture over time. So that's a brief picture of what the sector looked like entering COVID. Our initial survey undertaken in its immediate aftermath revealed an average loss of projected income for artists to the end of this month to be just under £4,000, with freelancers working in the gig economy, some of the most vulnerable. People who can't avail of the self-employed income support scheme because they don't meet the criteria. For organisations, the average loss of earnings for the same period was around £38,000. Damien and Jilly will put the human faces behind those figures in a moment. So what's needed? First, we welcome the announcement by the Minister of a £1 million support programme with an initial 500000 towards an organisation's emergency programme, which will complement our own much oversubscribed Artists' Emergency Programme. This is a good start. However, we know more will be required if the sector is to survive this crisis and to emerge, albeit perhaps in a different shape, and continue to make the rich and innovative contribution it does to our society. We've just collated further information about the deficits our organisations are predicting to the end of the year, and these conservatively estimate at this early stage, I stress, a figure of almost 4 million. And I've also laid out some of the further support measures we would like to see, which would help the sector recalibrate itself, including preparing for reopening, be it indoors or outdoors, so I won't repeat those. What has become crystal clear is the funding model so carefully and painstakingly created over many years to support the ecosystem that is the arts here in Northern Ireland is now broken. The prospect of recovering the catastrophic loss of earned income is minimal, even with moving to digital platforms, which won't be monetized to the degree needed, or putting on socially distanced performances outdoors and eventually indoors, although we are working to help organizations just do those very things where they can. Our arts sector here has been in the forefront of creating equality and access in ways which are the envy of other arts councils in these islands. Just like the health service, many offer a huge variety of activities and services 
free at the point of delivery. That must be sustained if some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged in our community are to be supported to enjoy their rights to access the arts. I'd like now, with your permission, Chair, to hand over to Gilly and Damien to give some human examples of the impact our sector faces. Okay. Good afternoon, members. In our recent Artists Emergency Programme, we had two applications from a husband and wife uh, team, both performers who have been lucky enough to have enjoyed regular theatre employment in the sector. Both have lost their income overnight with no sight of improvement, even with the lockdown easing. They are expecting their first child in September, and with both being performers, there's no possibility on relying on one partner's income for the foreseeable future. Even work which they would have done in between acting jobs has dried up, as I'm sure the committee will know that many actors work in the hospitality and bar sectors, and when the acting work is quiet, that's, that's what they do. This couple, this soon-to-be family, are in a precarious situation. And despite the obvious joy of anticipating a new arrival, their future is on a knife edge. In terms of mental health among the sector, tomorrow the Arts Council, along with the University of Atypical, an arts and disability charity, we're announcing our Deaf and Disabled Artist Support Fund awardees. This fund will be supporting 29 deaf and disabled artists with awards of up to £1,000. Many of these artists have mental health illness, and the impact statements that we've received in relation to COVID-19 were alarming and distressing. We know that our disabled artists have been affected more deeply than other members of the sector with isolation, loneliness, and anxiety being felt more acutely than ever. A survey of health and well-being in the creative sector, which was published two years ago by Inspire and the University of Ulster, highlighted staggering statistics. The likelihood of a mental health problem in the arts sector is three times that of the general population. A high proportion, 60%, reported having had suicidal thoughts. 37% had, had a plan made for suicide and 16% had made a suicide attempt in their lifetime. When you comprehend these statistics during a global pandemic, one that has shifted in a negative direction, the mental health and well-being of so many it's not difficult to imagine the worrying level of poor mental health in our arts sector right now. Damien, I'd like to bring you in at this moment. Uh, well, good afternoon, members. Um, I just want to give a very brief sort of pen picture of three key organisations in Northern Ireland um, and the impact that's happening currently. Um, one will be the Lyric Theatre, the other will be Ulster Orchestra and uh, also Grand Opera House. But all of this is actually relevant, I think, to uh, smaller arts organisations and in particular venues outside uh, Belfast, um, the regional theatre venues in particular. The indications are from what intelligence there is in GB and in Ireland that uh, theatres and theatre spaces won't be opening at best until 2021. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. There are uncertainties about being able to book touring productions that might be travelling around. There are obvious problems there. That will affect the Opera House of Belfast, also several regional venues, look at the Waterside, Playhouse, Millennium Forum. Also, you know, Bernalvin, uh, Strabann, Oma, Ballymena, all, all, all the regional theatre venues will be subject to this kind of pressure as well, and that will have impact on local authorities. So even shows that are designed and cast elsewhere will find it difficult to get uh, you know, into Northern Ireland. So that's before you even start to think about the necessary changes backstage in these venues, as well as the auditorium facilities for um, the public, and then the impact and costs that would come from that. These are all things that are quite hard to predict at this stage and anticipate and they're just doing the work on them now. 
the Lyric, uh, which is the main product, uh, producing theatre, the only producing theatre in Northern Ireland, had to has already had to pay back um, advances on sales um, from the closed in the middle of March. Um, the estimates at best, if you take social distancing into account, would be maybe 10% uh, occupancy across all shows. So you're looking at reduction in trading income, reduced footfall to the theatre, including you know when the, the bar and the cafe and so on. So costs go up based on maintaining a building and to comply with social distancing, and the deficit starts to climb uh, already. And I think this is May um, at the start of a financial year, and we're already looking at, as Rushing said, you know, upwards of four million uh, in deficits across the arts sector by the end of the year. Um, the the uh, furlough um, option that some organisations have been able to avail of, the Lyric certainly was able to do that. Those staff, 75% of the staff are in furlough. They'll be coming back onto the payroll um, by uh, in stages after July, and then that will add other pressure onto the budgets that they have there. So that will bring its own risks. Um, I think in relation to how uh, the cash flow operates as we get into the autumn. The orchestra, uh, which is the biggest funded organisation that we have, and also happily very sophisticated in terms of how it can um, respond to drastic circumstances such as this, they come up with 10 possible scenarios. And they've opt- the one that they've opted for is one that would see a potential activity beginning around about January 2021. Very, very limited um, actual performance, but also with um, some online activity. But again, even over a period of whatever that is, three months, um, you're looking at significant deficit at the end of that period. Oddly, if that activity began earlier by a couple of months, the deficit increases because actually putting on shows without getting the uh, income coming in increases the, the losses that are happening at that stage. So again, the very um, the, what Roshin had said earlier about the um, the model being broken, um, I think is demonstrated by how those organisations operate. The Opera House is a big, you know, receiving theatre as you call it. It's over a thousand seats, a bit like the Millennium Forum in Derry, but is looking for product coming in. It's big from around the, uh, Britain, um, touring product, which isn't going to be happening. As it happens, the, the Opera House is closed currently for refurbishment, which brings its own challenges. But the income that's generated at the Opera House is 83% of its income is actually brought in. Um, 83% of the turnover is brought in through the door. And our funding as an arts council is less than 10%. So the income impact from box office at the Opera House will be very significant indeed. And that's another thing we need to be very aware of. So I think when you look at the the scale there, the challenge is about what reopening is going to mean in practical terms for each of those very different venues. And then you extend that throughout Northern Ireland right to, uh, you know, community centres and to schools where performances might happen. Um, You're looking at a very complicated, uh, you know, logistical problem that is going to have to be solved before we'll be in a position to reopen these. These are all, those three are particularly visible cultural organisations. And I think it's fair to say that all three of them would have considerable risk at the moment. Chair, that concludes our submission to you. Thank you. Thank you um, for that briefing. Um, It certainly was very stark. We've had briefings uh, over recent weeks from local councils, from the the charity and voluntary sector, and now from uh, from the arts sector. And um, I mean, we often think of the arts and we think of the mental health of the people that actually enjoy um, our arts sector and how that is being affected. Um, But quite often we forget about the mental health of those that work within the sector uh, and how they must be feeling right now. Um, and I suppose if, if uh, uh, I want to ask you if just a few questions, you know, if we don't see that adequate um, funding being put into the arts sector, 
How will our, I suppose the first question is, how do you determine then that the arts sector will look like here in Northern Ireland um, in sort of the next year to, to five years' time if adequate funding is not put in? And I suppose then um, uh, also looking at going back and, the, uh, and uh, going back to, into theatres and the, 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 the reduction in the income there and the increased losses um, and I suppose asking then do, do we need to then look at uh, department need to look at developing a strategy in collaboration with the, ins the, the sector to, to ensure its survival going into the future and then um, thirdly I wanted to ask you then about um, the uh, 500,000 um, the fund that, has, uh, that is there that is looking at the Artist Emergency Fund and then there's still then a, a £500,000 or uh, is it another 500000 yet to be determined? Yeah. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just then um, any ideas of how that is going to be used and when you're going to see that coming forward? If you could just start off with answering those few questions. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, uh, we drew out the mental health difficulties faced by our artists and I'm very pleased that you picked that up uh, because often people forget that as you said um, the arts often provides a solace and a source of being uplifted a source of being entertained but we rarely think about the people who present them and who put themselves out there in very difficult circumstances so thank you for that recognition what will uh, the next uh, year plus look like? Well, that's precisely the issue that we're trying to grapple um, with, Chair. We're aware, and we've given you some examples in your briefing, of organisations who have the ability, uh, which have moved on to various digital platforms. Yeah. Um, we've also made the point um, that not all digital activity can be monetized. And we're also very aware of the digital divide in our society and um, when we think about how school children are, are struggling with homeschooling who don't actually have devices. So it's part of an answer uh, for some who have the technical uh, and artistic ability to deliver what it is they do online and get some income from that, but it's only a very small part of the equation. We're also very aware that um, the whole realm of driving um, theatre, driving performances and cinema has been discussed of late. And again, there will be some organisations that will be able to move in that direction. But what we do know, and Damien has already alluded to this in a way, is that putting on work in different venues other than the one that you normally uh, use or, or do will bring with it associated extra cost. So to answer your question, what would it look like in a year uh, uh, and beyond, I think the answer is we don't really know yet. What we do know, um, and Damien again referenced this in his remarks, is that programming as we know it in our venues once reopened, and hopefully they will, will not look like what it did before. Um, and it will take at least a year to 18 months for some organisations presenting work um, to get back into those theatres with an audience, uh, an audience perhaps which is only 30% of what it was like previously. Because the great unknown in all of this as well is how will audiences react to being in an enclosed space in the absence of a vaccine to protect them. So we're trying to do, uh, sorry, we are doing some work to try and understand better what are the issues that audiences and people who go to venues uh, face. Uh, what are their fears? How can we reassure them, um, given the health advice at the time? And we have to look at um, audience reaction uh, and their ability and willingness to take risk. Um, as this pandemic unfolds. Um, in terms of the loss um, of income for the sector, I personally cannot see um, the, 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 the diversification into other types of activity replacing 
that earned income, which, as I said, stood at 25 million last year in the context of uh, a deficit, a global deficit of around 4 million in the sector. That is a very difficult place to climb back from when you are very small and fragile to begin with, much as we will try and help them plot a way forward, which is part of our role as an Arts Council. So, of course, we welcome the support of our department and our minister in terms of the additional resources. And I think we are working well with them to look at what are the essential components of a strategy so that the arts sector can survive this pandemic and bridge us into the future uh, once more. Uh, thank you. Perhaps, uh, sorry, do you want somebody else want to comment? No, okay. Um, no, thank you, Roisin, for that. And I suppose it, it, it is that moving forward where you have to, when you, you talk about reassuring audiences and uh, to come back and to, to come back and enjoy our arts sector and that reassurance of audiences will, will I would assume then there will, the, the income will not be as what it was before because we will still have to have measures in place should be social distancing wherever that might be and so there are losses that are going to be there even going into the future even if audiences are assured um, that it's safe to come back um, to various venues and um, so there will be continued I mean the losses will continue um, for some time going forward. I, I mean, I, it wasn't that long ago that we had a briefing here when the committee uh, was started back again and we talked about our arts sector, about our film industry, about various things and how proud we are of that and how we should be shouting more uh, you know, about what Northern Ireland does well. And we, within the arts, we do many things very, very well. And, um, you know, and it's just making sure we don't lose that. Um, that that doesn't get reduced, that we don't we don't lose those wonderful people, many of whom I know are self-employed, um, that that do some wonder that do great work. Um, so I, you know, I for one certainly will will be watching this one as well with interest um, to, going forward. And I just I just want you to know that that I do appreciate everything that you are doing. I love the fact that you you gave us all of those ideas for each of our constituencies of the various things that are taking place. I, I know of several of them in North Belfast. My own son went to circus school for a number of years, so I know it very well. I thought that's a great idea that they're doing that, you know, the, the weekly challenge. Um, so I, I, I just want, I want, to, I want you to feed that back, that we appreciate that as well, um, that, that it, you know, where they can continue, where they can continue to entertain and to challenge the general public, I think that's great. Um, so I, I just want to, on record for myself, to say thank you for that. Um, I'm going to open up um, for questions from members. I'm going to go to the members in the room this time. And I'll go to Kelly first. Yes, thank you very much, Roisin, and, and the team there. Um, can I just say that um, it was quite a, a harsh um, story that you told today. Um, the detail about how many people are struggling, artists are struggling with their mental health through this crisis um, really does bring it quite to home. Um, I believe that the wealth of society is measured by how much people enjoy themselves and, and are together in the opportunities that are presented to them, and that comes from a rich cultural heritage. Um, but I wanted to ask you about some of the things that are within your presentation. Um, on Within it, you talk about the several funding streams. Can I just take you to that? Um, on page, it's page 34 for us, I think it's page three on your um, presentation about what have you done and thank you as an Arts Council for, for being proactive and, and taking action. And um, We're seeing so many of the umbrella bodies, their strength is coming forward at this time and it's a lot for you guys to bear. But I'm just looking there where you talked about um, they, you've reallocated money from an already depleted lot, lottery budget for the Artists' Emergency Programme. It was up to 500,000 where people could ha apply for grants of up to um, 5,000 pounds. Just doing the calculations, the minimum number of grants that would be processed there would be 100 grants. What is roughly at this stage, can you say, um, the average type of amount of money that people are applying for, or, or is that being awarded yet? Yes, it has. I bring my colleague in, if you don't mind, Noreen McKinney, Director of Arts Development. Lost. I'm sorry. I realised. I I think that I think that I was on mute. 
Okay, go ahead, Noreen. You can hear me now. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, the committee may be aware that we, within two weeks of opening the program, we, we opened in early May and we had to close it on the 11th of May, some two weeks in, because by that stage we had received 300 applications requesting over a million pounds. And as you know, the, the budget that we um, were able to put together from repurposed funds was 500,000. We've allocated that entire amount and we were able to supplement it with um, an, an additional 50k and our second we've made the first announcement of the first tranche of awards and we're just about to um, approve through our grants committee the second tranche and that will be completely then allocated. Um, the average awards we made very few at the total five um, K ceiling amount. Um, we did make some, and those tended to be for projects where um, there were collaborative projects amongst a number of artists. But I would say um, we we didn't make many awards above 3K, and indeed many of them were um, a lot smaller than that. Um, I believe I believe we've made about 200 awards in total, but I would have to check that figure. And what we'll do now is um, all of the applications that we weren't able to fund that were recommended for funding, we'll be using those to present to the department and the minister um, so that they can make a decision on the balance of the 500k of the 1 million package and um, that they might want to add some additional money into the artist's emergency programme. So hugely oversubscribed and Jilly was able to give you a flavour of some of the types of issues that artists and creative practitioners are facing and what they were applying to us for. And just to say, we, we were humbled um, by the um, extent of the need and by the circumstances that people were facing. And then, of course, our ability limited, albeit, um, to address those, but we have done our best. And should, should the minister want to allocate um, a little more um, from the 500 k which is the balancing budget to see what demand is like across the artist's emergency programme and the organisational emergency programme, then you know we, we've got a very substantial case, um, need-based case there. I hope that answers the question. It certainly does, actually. It's, it's answered my second question. Um, we've seen it in other areas, for instance, in the community and voluntary sector where the dormant accounts scheme is sitting unspent at the moment. And the question is, what could you use that money for now? The 500,000, that budget, the balancing budget that's still there, it's, to me it seems, you know, the money is needed now, but it could fly out the door, um, you know, just to meet current costs and there would be no development going forward so I'm, I'm delighted to hear that you guys are already thinking about packaging something together the other just my last question chair is one of the things that we have noticed that has worked very well for instance when i look at, at an organization like sport ni they have been quite um, proactive in encouraging different parts of their um, sector um, to come up with guidance that will help people to come back um, for performances or whether it's you know exhibition space or whatever it may be um, I'm just wondering as the Arts Council will you be helping or producing a, a guidance manual that some artists and, and the art the sector can take away and adapt for their own um, situation because we know that for instance somebody that has dance compared to theatre compared to musicians it could be very different scenarios that they're considering that would make it safe for them and their audience are you being funded or are you being supported as an umbrella body that you as the council can help provide that sort of baseline guidance and then others run forward with that and Damien I'm going to ask you to reply to this hello yes the, Sorry, the, um, the there's already a, some guidance has been provided in the Republic of Ireland particularly for theatre and performance venues which has been brought together by uh, sectoral bodies there. And we are currently looking at how that might be adapted for use in Northern Ireland. 
and I think again being able to be sensitive to the larger venues as well then as to the variety of uh, locations in which you know performances, theatre, dance, and other types of activity, especially with young people and older people, uh, you know, would take place. The logistics of all of that, uh, the the actual detail of it, will have to be led by government guidance in relation to social distancing. And then there are the added uh, complexities of how you get people physically in and out of a building and how you do that safely. And I think the biggest question of all, uh, I think, uh, you know, was was referenced a few moments ago by one of the the members, which is this idea of, uh, you know, of audiences feeling safe in a location. And this is the the big challenge now, is to try to focus on uh, what... Uh, measures can be brought in in order to persuade a public that has been um, chilled, if you like, uh, away from social, uh, uh, you know, gatherings, and how to you know warm that up again in order to get people back in. And that could be certainly in uh, in GB. They're looking at a recovery period, maybe up to up to 2024, for that fully to be um, you know repaired or uh, you know to be. Um, a new mechanism for getting people back into those venues. So we are we are looking now at that next stage of uh, what happens when reopening is uh, you know medically um, available. How then do you manage to translate that into the movement of people through a box office and into a, an enclosed space? And those are going to be challenges for galleries, as they are for you know schools and subsequently for. Um, theatre venues. That's what I was going to just ask you there, just to, uh, this is my last question, I promise. Um, just with that, you're not on your own as a sector, there will be others like schools you've just mentioned um, who will also be faced with, with similar issues, different sectors of course, but, but very similar issues about moving groups of people in and out of buildings, sitting together, um, you know, using bathrooms for instance, you know, turning on a light switch, you know, refreshments. Um, I'm just wondering, have have you had any opportunity through the department? Um, has there been any discussion about some joined up thinking with other um, government departments or other sectors or other people who would deal with groups? I mean, audiences, yeah. Not at this stage, um, uh, Kelly, because I suppose we've really been focused principally on trying to understand what the impact is like on our sector, and that's evolving and then secondly how we can support them through the emergency measures we're introducing to help them weather partly the storm and then over the last few weeks looking to see what are the requirements as we um, move to try and bridge them into the future and so it's certainly something that we will pick up with our department and we are in uh, full discussion with them on these matters and if schools can show the way in terms of how this is done and there's valuable experience there, we will want to learn from that. Absolutely. No, thank you very much, guys. And just to reiterate again, um, the situation that you're all going through is is a desperate situation. Um, certainly recognise that. And thank you very much for a very powerful presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, Andy, have you any comments or questions? I've not at the moment, Chair. Uh, the questions I have have been covered by the extensive document and yours and Kelly's follow up questions. No problem, thank you. Okay, I'll move to our telephone lines. Um, Carol, have you any comments or questions? I'm the first person, I'm the first third party Okay, Sinead, go ahead. Thank you, Kelly. Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks to Rochine and, and the guys from the Arts Council uh, for coming in. To, to give us that presentation. And I concur with the, the sentiments that have already been expressed, um, you know, the predicament that our artists and our and people at the creative industry find themselves in at the time. I mean, it's, it's hard for all of us, but people who, who live in depends on the ability to socialise and get there and it's severely impacted with this like, the really good feel for them. Um, I, listen, I've met Roisin on, on numerous occasions, uh, and, you know, I do not have to be convinced uh, of the fact that our, our sector is severely underfunded, um, notwithstanding uh, COVID. Um, and, and I think we do, in the time ahead, when we're in a post-COVID reality, uh, if and when we get there, um, I, I do seriously need to, to sit down 
concept about how we're going to fund our arts sector in the future and uh, realistic, how we're realistically fund our arts sector in the future. Um, and I think we need to move beyond this in that um, people who engage in arts or the creative industries do it as a hobby or a pastime. I think we need to, to come to the realisation that um, arts and the creative um, industries are an economic driver and, and they're a, a net contributor to our, to our economy. And I think we have to start funding them, funding them if not. If, um, so, so basically, you know, when we look at uh, the impact that COVID had on all sectors, you know, the arts sector and the industry won't be any different. Uh, and we, we talked um, about how every sector will have to at new ways of working um, and new realities. You know, the arts and cultural sectors will be any different. And the way we fund uh, the arts sector won't be any different. So I think we have to look at, at how we're going to fund and, and more importantly, what, what we're going to fund and what we're going to prioritize. Um, the time. So tell you that, the, the that I had in terms of the, the breakdown of the application to, to the creative um, support fund. Um, and there's just a mention of the likes of the orchestra and, and organizations like that. And um, I wonder if the members in the arts science could give an idea as to, you know, whether the likes of the orchestra, the MAC organizations like that, whether they did a bid, a COVID bid to the Arts Council for additional funding and, and if they could give us some information as to, to what is is the case. Um, in terms of the, um, the furloughing and the self-employed um, issues, I, you know, I, I have to say I, I'm well supportive of that. And I wonder how the Arts Council uh, made representation to the Minister for Economy with respect to that. If they haven't, um, it's good. And if this committee should support them um, in whichever was like the Minister to, to offer our input into that, I, I think that's good idea. Um, in terms of um, theatre spaces, and uh, we know, uh, so sorry, I'm not sure who gave the point earlier, you know, they won't be opening again in, in the short and medium term, but they gave be on before we see theatre spaces opening again. Uh, I think I think we need a we need a plan if we look at this. Um uh, while some areas of the, the arts and creative sector might not position uh, to open up other areas other art areas will be. Um, so it's not getting back to looking at how we fund things and, and, and what we fund um, and maybe maybe certain things need to be prioritized just um you know with with our COVID, uh, COVID Glass is on. Um, as well, you know, I just want to, to make the point. We spend a lot of time talking about the big headline organizations, and I don't think we, we um, can forget about the small community, um, community arts and, and, and those sectors. Because, you know, they have been playing the, the, last, uh, the last eight or nine weeks um, in terms of keeping people's morale and, and, and spirits alive. So I think we need to really get serious how we, how we fund. Um, Community organisations who are um, who are really at, at, at the heart of both these within communities, and I think we need to just not forget about those organisations. And um, I know every 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 group um, will argue the the, the work they do, but um, I just need it we need to be eye to that. Just as well in terms of, of looking at the challenges that are coming ahead, you know we can't um, disregard Brexit. Um, we will have that to contend with um, in the next short while as well. Um, and I'm wondering how given any partner with the Arts Council of Ireland because we need to protect our arts product um, you know, as a whole across this island. Um, and I don't know Brexit will have an effect on, um, on, on companies' ability to tour um, and things like that. So I'm just given any, uh, if, if uh, you're saying who can give us a, an update just on the as well. So, that's it for me. You sure? Nice, you did. Have questions there, no? <laughs> well, I, I will try and answer some of them, Sinead, because um, I, you were breaking up a bit and I couldn't hear everything that you said. So, I'll try and have a stab at it anyway. Um, in terms of the organization's emergency program, 
that uh, principally aimed at small to medium-sized organisations who have been impacted. And it will offer them up to £25,000 to help them with their cash flow problems. Inevitably, they will have those. And or if they want to deliver additional activity to meet the needs in their particular community. So, for example, we know we have had wonderful examples of organisations like the Greater Chantalo uh, Arts uh, Centre in, in Derry um, helping with deliver meals uh, and food parcels to uh, the families of children who are struggling but who, who would have gone to the, uh, uh, into their art centre for an activity. So it is certainly true to say that um, our local grassroots community arts organisations have absolutely um, gone that incredible um, extra mile to help where help is required and really for me are, are, are absolutely shining lights. They know their locality, they know their audience, they know their community extraordinarily well. And so the organization emergency program is principally, as I said, aimed at those smaller organizations who will find themselves inevitably struggling. So it's not just for the bigger ones. In terms of the issues around surrounding Brexit, um, we do have very strong relations, as the committee will know, with our colleagues in Ancora Island in the Republic, and we do uh, meet uh, on many an occasion uh, over the years, uh, almost 35 plus years, we've had um, cooperation with them. So we're very aware of the particular issues that Brexit may pose in relation to touring product um, on this island, both in terms of festivals, but also artists coming in from third, uh, third countries who might find it difficult to get a visa to come and perform at a festival. And we have talked to them uh, uh, about those issues. And I think they share, they share the same concerns that we have, because what we do know is that artists and arts organizations don't recognize boundaries in the way perhaps that uh, Brexit may um, impose on us. Um, they're global in their orientation and global in their aspiration, and that won't change in spite of COVID of that, I am sure. Um, I wasn't, I didn't know what else you were asking in terms of theatre spaces not being open in the short to medium term. Sinead, yeah, no, it's, go ahead, Sinead. Yeah, yeah, no, it, so it's just, it's just about, um, you know, so theatre spaces aren't going to be open until 2021. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's, you know, there, there will be funding and, you know, finances that those particular theatres will be able to access. I, I'm not suggesting for one moment that we leave them high and dry. What yeah. I'm saying is, you know, I think we need some targeted interventions here in terms of the, the you know, the arts organisations and the cultural organisations that are able to open that business center. You know, so we're starting to get things moving and we're, just, we're not waiting for the big, the big headline, <laughs> such as, you know, the MAC or, you know, the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just, it's just a plan in place to, to in, light, in, in line with the executive's recovery plan. So I don't know if you, if you guys have been studying it um, yeah. and, and, you know, inter, inter even your own uh, plans for reopening. So... Um, it was it was just just in terms of that. I, I appreciate if you don't have a, a response to it now. You know, I'm, I'm happy to engage with the after. Well, we can certainly pick that up, but we would agree with you. It's not just simply a question of the large venues um, opening when they can. We um, are, are we have very detailed plans drawn up by many of our arts organisations in which they are scenario planning for the future because. By their very nature, arts organisations are always looking to the future and always looking to have an audience to engage with. And, and it's very variable um, across our 100 plus funded organisations. Uh, but that future orientation is actively being considered by many of them because they know their lifeblood is their audience and their community with whom they engage. And they don't want to lose that contact. Um, they don't want to lose it in the pandemic because they know it's very hard to get it back in the future. So we can certainly pick up on some of the detail of that, Sinead, with you. Um, but we are, um, we, we are cautiously um, 
optimistic that some of our arts organizations will be able to uh, reopen and present work within the next year on a phased basis. However, we temper that with the recognition that with the loss of 4 million, uh, in, I'm sorry, the, the 25 million uh, earned income loss allied to the 4 million pound deficit, we could be talking, unless there is a rescue package, that our sector will be decimated. Because if people can't open their buildings and people can't perform and people can't do the things that they normally do, it affects our artists. They won't get work. And that's why we always refer to the art sector as an ecosystem. Our artists are the biggest cost in the art sector of the money that uh, our arts organisations get and earn. It goes to artists. Uh, and that's what's been lost. Um, so, yes, we can look to the future and try and bridge, um, uh, have a bridgehead into the future, of course. But really, the scale and impact of this pandemic has been so severe and people are really struggling to basically survive. And then, sorry, just the, the question on furloughing uh, as employees, whether a formal bid has been made to the Minister for the Company from the Arts Council. Russian, in case you didn't hear that properly, I think, because it's very broken, Sinead, you're a wee bit breaking up on us just a wee bit. Was that to do with the Department of the Economy and the furloughing of staff? And if we're looking at 2021 for some of the opening of venues, um, just what what um, conversations are taking place um, going forward with the Department of Com Economy, Sinead, yeah? Yep, spot on. Okay, Russia. Thank you. Uh, well, we're aware that there are a number of schemes um, opened by the Department of the Economy, including a micro-business hardship fund, which opened recently with a pot of £40 million, But that's not for charities, and many of our arts organisations are charities. That said, we know our own minister is opening up a fund for charities uh, with £15 million in the pot, and some of our organisations may need to avail of that. But when we look at how the retail, hospitality, tourism and leisure sectors have been supported, um, we would argue that a comparable scheme needs to be there for our arts organisations and our artists. Sinead, do you want to come back or are you happy enough with that? That's fine, thank you. I, I suppose, if you don't mind, I just want to come back on, on just a point there. I mean, we know um, within the arts we have our local authorities have various um, theatres and various things, and our local authorities have furloughed those staff um, that work within those businesses. And it's just then, there is a worry there if we don't see the furlough scheme continue um, uh, into even into 2021 that you're talking about for the opening possibly of some theatres and things. Um, it's the worry for that the staff there, I suppose, as well. So those conversations certainly need to be um, ongoing um, with, with the Department of the Co Economy and the Treasury as well um, for staff going forward. I suppose it's just to make that point also. Would that be right, Rashi? Uh, absolutely. That's a very important point, and thank you for drawing that out. Okay. Um, we'll move on then and go to Robin. Robin, are you there? Make sure your phone's not in silent or mute. I'm sure. Go ahead, uh, Robin. Thank, thank you and uh, welcome to delegation coming, uh, or not coming, but speaking with us today. I, I don't have any specific questions, uh, Chair, but I, I do recognise the contribution that... Uh, the arts overall makes to uh, life in East Belfast and most particularly East Side Arts and uh, the Strand Arts Centre who are, seem to dominate the, 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 the east of the city for arts. I would just say that arts overall, I think, uh, although and you yourself, Chair, made reference to the mental health situation within the arts sector, but it is uh, an aspect of uh, contributing to the mental well-being of society as a whole. Uh, and indeed, I, I suppose it enriches society as a whole uh, and stretching into our education system. Um, 
And, and I have heard it said, Chair, that uh, part of the attraction of inward investment has been uh, the arts sector offering a, a sort of a holistic uh, arts uh, covering the whole of Northern Ireland. So I don't have any uh, specific questions uh, uh, around the, the contribution of the, uh, the uh, discussions today, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, Carol, I'll move to you then. Hi, yes, um, and thanks very much for this presentation. Um, I mean, thank you, everyone. The, the, the turmoil that people are going through as a result of COVID on mental health, and particularly for the freelance and self-employed artists, they are particularly uh, impacted and more vulnerable. I suppose for me, um, what's missing from your sales is, you know, how are the COVID recovery plan is marked against your own advice and guidance, um, and maybe that's something that can be worked on in more detail later. Um, but I just want to ask, in terms of what, what money or what is the amount of due fees that the Arts Council need to get in order to support all the groups which is currently funded? Roshay? Yes, I think we've given you the figures for the deficit, which certainly, if people could have certainty around the fact that they wouldn't be expected to carry a deficit, which I said, as our best estimate, because we've asked the art sector at this stage, uh, at the end of May, stands at just under £4 million or thereabouts. So that's the quantum that we're aware of at this point, but as we know, it's an evolving picture. On top of that, we are also working with the department to get organizations the support they will need, and it will be technical support in many ways, to ensure that when they do reopen and when they are back in business, whatever shape or form that looks like, that the places in which that occurs are safe for audiences and that they receive the necessary support and technical advice that they require in order to ensure that is the case, including any adaptations to buildings uh, that may be necessary. Um, and we have to put a figure on that, but that will be predicated on working with each venue and each organization individually to assess what their needs are uh, and we we will need help that will be further uh, help capital help that will be required we don't have a figure on that as yet carol any comment on that or are you okay yeah i'm still um still thank you for their clarity needed i appreciate certainly in terms of capital adoption so not know until you get further on down the road and they're understandably will be Cost you all that, um, and I understand the figure of just four million, around four million for now, and as you say, that's evolving. But where I'm not clear at all is, as the Arts Council, where's your input into working with the department on bringing that guidance forward? Because it sounds to me like you're waiting on the guidance coming from the department. Surely, there's a, a discussion or conversations going on about what you all see representing artists um, and representing sectors um, even within the arts and cultural spectrum. Where, where is that joined up conversation going? Um, I just want to say there is a conversation uh, which has taken place with the department. We are using the work um, undertaken by the Theatre Forum in the Republic of Ireland and working with our um, Theatre NI umbrella body and our own capital project officer in the Arts Council to adapt the guidance and make sure that it is suitable uh, for our own uh, situation in, in Northern Ireland, including the fact that we have a health and safety executive, that local authorities have different powers and responsibilities in terms of environmental health. So there is some work to be done to make sure that it is relevant and up to date with our current le legislation um, in this part of the world. And that work has uh, has has begun. Okay, Carl. 
Yeah, and I suppose we'll look forward to seeing what that looks like. And finally, you know, the the strategy, the executive strategy, where, where's that kit? Because this pandemic is just going to turn everything in its head. And certainly from the presentation that Jelly gave in relation to the human impact on artists, um, part, what discussions are there, if any, in relation to the overarching strategy for arts and culture? We have um, produced our five-year strategy, which was um, over a year ago, which um, obviously had to be amended in light of the current pandemic. But our recent business plan, which was produced before COVID kicked in, we have reworked that. Um, and that's going to our board on Friday for approval uh, before it goes to the department for the minister to, to hopefully approve subsequently. But as you say, I think everything has changed in Northern Ireland. Um, all the cards have been thrown up in the air in many ways, and we need to reflect uh, about what the important building blocks for the future are and what that core will look like. And indeed, how we as a public authority are facing that challenge as we walk the steps along with our wonderful and vibrant sector, including its artists. And so we have reworked our business plan and we are in constant dialogue with the organisations and the artists that we support. Uh, and hopefully um, we will come up with the appropriate strategy that will bridge us, as I said, into the future as best we can. Thank you. OK, thank you, Carl. Mark? Mark, are you there? Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Chair, that the first two adjectives yourself and Kelly used to describe the content of the presentation were uh, stark and harsh. And I think it, 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 the longer I've listened, the worse it's got. Uh, obviously, everyone and every sector has, has been hit hard by the crisis that has engulfed us. Uh, it's hard to think of any or certainly many more so than our arts sector which was already despite the fact that there seems to be more and more acceptance or recognition of the role that arts can and do play in our everyday lives uh, throughout society that hasn't really ever been matched by <laughs> an increase in investment or support for the sector so the, 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 there wasn't any fact there, if you like, uh, I suppose in the centre or across the sector, be it the, the venues or the community uh, arts projects, and now they're really floundering uh, badly. Groups have used, as is their nature, creativity uh, to think of new ways of doing what they do and, and, and getting their stuff out there, but that can only go. Uh, so far, it's not putting too much bread on too many people's tables. In terms of the, the, the figure that you said come up with, and I know it's a provisional figure or, or, or it is evolving, four million pounds uh, that might be, be needed. I was wondering sort of what had happened in other jurisdictions and what actions had other governments taken uh, to support the arts sector in their respective jurisdictions and uh, like how that four million that you have come up with now and, and I know it's an ever changing picture of how it would compare uh, I suppose on a proportional basis with support offered elsewhere. I suppose the answer to that is that each of the other places have started with from a different vantage point. Um, I talked to colleagues recently in Wales and Scotland in particular, uh, and we're due to meet in early June to update ourselves along with colleagues in Ancora Allen and in Arts Council Linden. It has become clear that the scale of the problems that we are all confronting is similar. Um, the responses have been broadly similar, though so the scale of the resources 
that people have deployed in order to tackle the issue are different. And we started, as I said, from a different playing field. So other jurisdictions have open comparable programs in terms of artist and organizational emergency response programs. They have had some small amounts of money from central government and they have been able to repurpose some of their lottery funds in order to meet the need. We have done something similar here in Northern Ireland with the welcome uh, uh, announcement from the Minister uh, of the one million uh, from her own department's money. That is a start. Each of the Arts Councils I've spoken to said they will be returning to this issue in September, uh, and that will be a will be a, a key moment in which to assess what has been happening in the sector. We have a number of surveys currently out um, for, uh, in, in the research field. We're going back out again to ask our artists and our arts organisations uh, in the next month how COVID is continuing to impact on them across a range of um, indicators. And we're also going to be undertaking um, a public-facing survey uh, asking audiences, uh, potential audiences, uh, sorry, asking audiences what have they been consuming during this period of COVID and what is it they would wish to see in the future and how safe will they feel returning to venues and how do they think they can contribute to, the, um, to their organisations, to their much-loved arts organisations, through things like donations. Would they be willing to make a donation on top of a ticket price, for example? These are all things that we are considering um, in, at the moment, and that research should be with us probably by the end of July. And we'd be happy to share the results with the committee, of course. Okay. Uh Thank you. And then I suppose, uh, without repeating, I would just, I suppose, like to re-emphasise uh, some of the points made, particularly by Carl and Sinead, in terms of the need for, for the strategy that they brought forward or brought, brought to us as, at the earliest possible opportunity. And I suppose, in terms of Sinead's remarks, the importance of community-based arts projects, and I know uh, one of the the delegation spoke of in their own constituency, the Greater Chantalo Community Arts. They have been to the fore during this response, but it's 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 not just now. They provide extraordinary uh, services and activities right throughout the, any normal year. And uh, I think it's vital that organisations like that get support they need to survive and to thrive. You know, because of all the positive impacts they have across the, the survey. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, we'll move on to Fra. Have you any comments or questions, Fra? Uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank the delegation for their presentation and uh, just picking up on some of them. Most of the stuff has already been answered, but just to make uh, one point uh, or two points, uh, first of all, to commend the, the, the way their arts are uh, sort of, uh, on the, the work that they have done. You know, the mental well-being that people take from the various projects that go on, and that's from the Arts Council right down to the local communities. I, 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 I do believe uh, that, th th that this year will be a testing year uh, for many, and I have no doubt, no doubt in my mind uh, that, uh, that people will bounce back in it. But one of the questions that uh, Carl had asked us in, in, in the terms of uh, funding for resourcing. Uh, and you, you, know, you had mentioned uh, the library, the big library. And have you made an application have you, or have you sought meetings with them and to find out what they can, uh, given the circumstances, pick up the pieces? And given you said that they have already uh, possibly uh, given additional funding in Scotland and Wales, uh, that they can help? Um. Thank you for those remarks. Um, we have spoken to the Big Lottery Fund, and as was referenced earlier, they are in charge of dormant bank accounts. 
uh, which have not yet been opened for um, applications. So, yes, um, we have spoken to them and they are aware of the very particular and pressing needs of our um, sector, which is obviously part of a wider community and voluntary sector uh, in general terms. And so we hope very much that that um, will result in additional funding being made for grassroots um, organizations struggling to deal with the effects of um, uh, COVID uh, on their local communities and on their arts uh, projects. Um, so, yes, we have been in contact with others. We've also been talking to other trusts and foundations. Um, so the committee may well have noticed that the Freelance Foundation did make some hardship funding available for visual artists um, in Northern Ireland, uh, and that programme is just now up and running. So we have been in contact with other trusts and foundations, as I've said, in order to press upon them the urgency and the fragility of the situation here locally. Okay, Fred. Okay, thanks very much. And Chair, can I just make, uh, just make mention uh, that, um, that I commend uh, those many artists and community activists who, through social media, media are, are making life uh, that level of better through their and come to uh, the concerts and shows and uh, quizzes. Uh, I think that uh, that, 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 that they have uh, also added to and helped uh, through this difficult uh, uh, situation. No, absolutely, Fred. Very well, point well made. Um, the, the, they really have uh, been streamed into people's living rooms and back gardens over recent weeks and it has it's brought a bit of, of lightness and enjoyment, absolutely. So, no, we do give her thanks. Thank you, Fra. Um, uh, finally, Johnny, have you any comment or question? Johnny, are you there? No. Jonathan? No, it doesn't appear to be there. Um, uh, look, Thank you very much, uh, Roisin, Noreen, Damien and Jilly. Um, I really appreciate you coming in and briefing us, albeit at times it was very hard to listen to, some of the, the issues that you are facing. Um, I know as a committee it's our intention um, to get regular briefings on the, the, what's going on within our local councils and within our third sector. If the committee is in agreement, I would also be um, uh, would want to have regular briefings from yourself, and I imagine we'll do the same with the with Sports NI um, when we meet with them next week. Um, that, that I mean, I know during summer recess it'll not be like any other recess, but we will certainly be meeting as a committee. I would envisage um, during the summer, and I would hope to have you back in with us again, um, maybe around the, you know sort of the end of July or whenever. Just that we, we keep this under our watch. Um, we can't forget about the art sector. It is part of, the, of this committee scrutiny. Um, so uh, that would be what I would hope going forward, um, that uh, we certainly are here to listen and to try and intervene and help in any way we can. Um, so thank you very much for your briefing today. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed, um, Chair. Just to say we're very much uh, buoyed up by the support and understanding that this committee has shown and its appreciation for the role that arts and culture play in our wider society, and that's, um, that's very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, Nice. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, members, would you be in agreement with that, uh, that this is also something that we, we will have a watching brief on um, over the, the coming months ahead? Yes? Yes, yes please. Mm -hmm. Members on the phones in agreement with that? Yes? Agreed. Great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Members with that, then we'll move on then to agenda item number six, which is correspondence. Um, you'll find a memo at page 46 of your meeting packs and also a letter from the minister, which was in a tabled item that was sent through to you yesterday. Um, I'll go to our members on the phones first. Is there any comments or queries or are you all content to note? Content to note. Thank you, Carol. Everybody, anybody else content to note? Yes, content. Thank you. Okay, I'll, okay, go to members in the room. Kelly, did you want to bring something up? I was going to say um, the, the plan that has been presented, or the, 
the summary that has been submitted by the Minister and the Department is very good. My concern is about a forward plan and I was actually wondering if um, we could maybe write to the Minister to ask, you know, there's a lot of the, the COVID-19 assistance will be coming to an end mm -hmm. um, and how we're going to plan communications going forward so people understand when it's happening and why it's happening and, you know, so that we can just prepare people for this. Um, it's not coming to an end now, but it will be in the future. And I'm just wondering, that update is brilliant. It gives us a summary of everything that has happened. But what's next? What's after this? You know, when we look beyond the budget period in October, what's what's the plans going forward? And I know that there's quite a lot of what the minister has planned out will go through to the end of the financial year, but there's other items that won't. And we will see, for instance, an increase in the number of redundancies that are happening and more people coming to universal credit. That's more pressure on the department and staff. So I just wonder if we could ask what is the forward plan and if there's an opportunity at a future meeting perhaps for them to present something to us. No, that's a good point and, and, and I know um, with COVID everything has been um, uh, very knee-jerk, which it had to be, which is absolutely fine, um, but yeah, we do, that would be interested to see what the forward plan is, albeit that may change if, as well, we don't know what lies ahead in the coming weeks and months ahead, um, but yeah, I would be content if we could get a bit more information on that. Um, so, members, everybody else content um, as the correspondence memo um, as noted. And then we'll move on to item agenda number seven, which is our forward work programme. Members, next week on the 3rd of June, we will be briefed by the department on the June monitoring round. And also we'll have a briefing from Sport NI. Then on the 10th of June, the committee will be briefed on the COVID-19 funding to supporting people. And then we have also been advised that the Minister has decided on her position in respect of the reform of liquor licensing and officials are eager, eager to move on this legislation. So are members then content that we have a briefing on the liquor licensing issue for our 17th of June meeting? So are uh, members uh, content with that so far of our forward work programme? Yes? Yes. Great? Mm -hmm. Yes. Agreed. Um, also, members, um, as I've mentioned there, whenever we're talking to uh, the Arts Council, I would like to get in again, if you're in agreement, um, solace back in again before the end of June, so possibly the 24th, to give us an update on um, the state of councils at that stage. I think we're going to have to do this with all of our different groups, um, that we speak to them sort of maybe every six or eight weeks, just to check that um, to, to, to how, how they're managing and going forward. So if members content that we ask Solace again to brief us at the end of June. Yeah. Yes. yes. Agreement? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, um, I have to say I was a bit alarmed at the presentation that Solace had gave, particularly in relation to potential rates increases. So perhaps before the, the presentation to the committee, we could try and agree some questions in advance so they're not blindsided. Okay. Because yeah. some councils have been acting very responsibly gathering reserves should not be penalised for those who don't. No, I agree. No, you're you're right. And we did ask the council, we did ask Solace if they could provide us on information of the financial state of every council because we know all councils are not going to be in the same position as you well said, Carol. Um, so I think we would want to have that information before that briefing. I don't know if we've received it. It's been asked for. Um, so uh, we're still waiting on that coming from uh, Solace. So I would want to have that before we get briefed by them as well. So uh, does that, that will help also, Carol? Sure, yeah, great. Okay, was that yeah. your Fra? Yes, it's okay. just, it's just on that point. Uh, can we also try to ensure that, uh, that, that, that whatever information we ask for doesn't arrive uh, the morning of the meeting, that there's a couple of days notice so that people can uh, analyze what the, the information that they've been given so that they can uh, have a, a good discussion uh, in relation to the, uh, what's happening in the local government. Uh, I absolutely agree 100% with you, Fra. You and I sat on a previous committee, I remember, where we were given information yeah. the morning of the briefing and they were told to go away and come back another week. Um, so, okay. yeah, I would be, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I, I think they, they weren't too bad. They did give us the information on time. Most of the groups that we have had so far 
um, to this committee since it, it restarted has been very good at supplying information. But no, I, I would be in agreement with you with anybody that's coming to brief us. They we, yeah. we would want no. You're absolutely right. Okay, members. Sorry, who's that? Nate. Shanae, go ahead. Sorry, sir. It's just um, so a while ago we got a briefing from the uh, regional development people. Um, and, and I can't remember if I asked this last week, but I'm wondering if we can get an update from them just in terms of their forward work program and you know you know how they how they plan to bring uh, whatever projects were in the pipeline forward. Just you know, obviously as we're, as we're moving out of COVID and. Um, you know their their plans for recovery and things like that. So it would be, be interesting, be worthwhile, I think, just to get an update from them as well. And who was that from again, Sinead, that update? From I think from regional development. Oh, infrastructure. Uh, no, 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 our own guys in, in in the department. Okay, okay. One one of the guys that was up the committee with us the last day was Jared Murray, I think. Um. So it's just because I know there's a there's a few before COVID. Um. Before COVID struck, uh, I know there was a few um, revitalisation projects happening here in South Down, and I just I, I want to get an update just on on generally where, where they all are, you know. Okay, fair enough. We'll do that. That's grand. No problem. Okay, m members, I'm going to move on to agenda item number eight, which is any other business. Um, we'll go to the room first. Any any other business? Either of you? I was no? just going to ask. Um, we're seeing plenary sessions starting to change. Um, originally, we would have met on a Thursday. I'm just wondering, are we intending to continue on on Wednesdays for the foreseeable? Until I, I think that is the chairperson's liaison group that, that set the when we would be having, as we are, are part of that, of when we're having committee meetings. Um, I don't know when they're due for another meeting, but um, that will be picked up at that. I would envisage of if any changes in days. So at, mo at present, we're still Wednesday meeting. Um, so, but if we, if that changes or if members want that to change in any way, that can be brought forward. I suppose to the the chairperson's liaison group. Um, okay, members on the phone. Um, Mark, if you any AOB? Yeah, thank you, sir. Trying to remember when it was. Was it last week or the week before when officials were in? A brief us on the housing amendment bill, but at that point, some members, myself included, had, had sought clarity on a, a number of issues or answers to a couple of questions, and the officials committed to write back with that information. I was just wondering, could that maybe be chased up in advance of the debate next week? Yeah, that's no problem. They, they, um, Sean's telling me here that that has been that, that, that's been written to you, and they're just waiting on responses from the from the department. So and even if we could we'll chase up that response, because it might be useful for for and inform next week's debate. That's grand, Carol. Have you any AOB? No, grand. Fra, any AOB? No, okay, thank you. Sinead, anything further you want to bring up? No, thanks, Chair. Uh, Robin, have you anything further? No, obviously not. And I don't know where Johnny went to, so I'm not even going to ask him if he's anything. Right. Sorry, Robin, did you want to say anything? Yeah, maybe I missed it in the, in the correspondence there, Chair, but uh, the letter from the Committee for the Economy referenced the North West 200 and the letter from Mr. Uh, White, uh, who's the event director, Northwest 200. Where, where, where is that correspondence sitting at the minute, Chair? Just bear with me, and I will ask one of the. I'll ask Kevin if he knows, sir. Well, the the letter itself is at page 48, but what we've suggested in yeah. the correspondence memo, unless. Uh, Robin wants to take a different approach. Sorry, what is, what is right, Robin, the, the letter is on page 48 of your I've got, I've got the letter, Chair. Just what has been suggested, sorry, I've missed that. What has been suggested what? Have I just missed what, what, what has been suggested, Chair? Um, I, I think we've just got down to note. But we have, to, right, okay. we have it down to note. Are, are you in agreement with that, or do you want us to do something else around that, or are you okay no, with that? No, uh, sorry, I, 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 find, I find it, Chair. Sorry. You're all right. No, it's okay. just it's such a significant event within the uh, sporting calendar and indeed the economy. Yeah, I know. Um, no, I, just, I find it. Sorry, Chair. All right. Okay. Apologies. Not a problem. Not Thanks. a problem. Okay, members, we'll move on then to agenda item number nine, 
which is date and time and location of next meeting. Our next meeting will take place on Wednesday, the 3rd of June at 1 p.m. here in room 29. Can I thank everybody present today for their thank patience? You, thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.